Hello, Sunshine. I'm Alexi Lawless, and welcome to the State of the Union podcast, where we look at the beautiful game on and off the field through the lens of red, white, and blue colored glasses. This episode, we'll be talking, well, the transfer deadline madness that is upon us, leads, the great American novel, MLS season pass, Brazilian coaches, weddings, and so much more. But first, joining me, as always, my friend, my colleague, and my guiding light, David Mossy, a soccer savant and a Fox soccer researcher and writer extraordinaire. Mossy, how are you doing on this? Well, we're recording Wednesday, February 1st in the year 2023. I am doing well. Uh, we should note producer Sean Sullivan is not here. He has been called into jury duty. It's unclear whether he'll be selected for a case. I might be in the minority here, but I'm hoping he is selected and it's like an O.J. Simpson year-long murder trial. <laughs> yeah, you never know what you're going to get. I served on a jury once where it, was, it wasn't it was that that exciting. It was, it was typical L.A. where one person was suing another over plagiarism over a story that they, uh, that they had, but it was nothing even remotely uh, like that. So we don't know when we're going to see uh, Sean again. But you know what? We have wonderful people that pick up the slack and who knows? You might get Wally pipped. It's it's uh, it's happened before. Uh, have you watched anything? Anything interesting going on? Not really. The only thing I've watched since our last pod is this uh, David Letterman interview with the president of Ukraine, Zelensky, which is on Netflix, uh, which I found actually quite fascinating. Really? Yep. You liked it. Uh, I have not watched that. Now, but what I I think we should say that today. Um, relative to watching things, because this is always a, a hot topic when it comes to streaming and everything. Today is the first day that you are able to purchase the um, the new Apple uh, MLS fare, okay? Uh, the season pass, MLS season pass for, on Apple TV over there. And, you know, we've talked about this on numerous uh, pods here. So I went through the whole thing and navigated through to purchase it. Now, because I'm already a subscriber to Apple Plus, Apple TV, uh, I get it for less and it cost me $79. Now, that, that's neither here nor there um, in terms of me telling this story. I was much more interested in how it was going to appear. Uh, when you go on the site, it wasn't, I'll be honest, it wasn't, I was a little disappointed in that it wasn't boom, because this is a huge thing for Apple. This is unprecedented in terms of what they are doing and kind of, you know, like Apple does from a technological perspective, something completely different and pushing the envelope for what they are doing relative to live sports and getting into it. Maybe this is, you know, that that test uh, going forward for some bigger things, and it probably is. But I would have kind of liked to have seen it right front and center. I had to look a little bit, and eventually you can find something up there. The, the signing up for it was very, very easy, especially since I'm already a, a, a subscriber. And now we'll see ultimately what this platform uh, is going to bring in terms of the uh, the presentation. But I will be, because I'm a huge MLS fan, I will be spending a lot of time on this Apple platform because that is where you can go, whether you're here in Los Angeles or anywhere else in the world. And you know, the other part is, and I was thinking about this and I was talking to someone, we're not going to be able to necessarily assess and you know, qualify and quantify how successful this ultimately is. Because in, you know, in normal television, in traditional television, we have Nielsen ratings and that kind of stuff, which isn't perfect, but it certainly gives us an idea of what is happening. In this context, it's basically about subscriptions. And while the information certainly is available to someone like Apple, and I'm sure even more so than anything in a traditional way, they could, you know, they could give you incredible data as to who's watching, how much they're watching, what they're watching, all of that kind of stuff. But since it's all proprietary and it's not done by an outside source, I don't think we're going to know as to how successful this ultimately is unless it is really successful, in which case they can kind of put out whatever they want. If it's, if it's not successful, they're not going to put out anything, and we're not going to be able to know. If it is successful, you can bet your ass that they are going to put it out and maybe have some numbers to back it up. But this is the new world in which we live in. What will be interesting is, as we go into the future, is it just a cyclical type of thing, where we're right back where we started, where somebody from the outside comes in as this clearinghouse, as this outside entity, uh, and as this theoretically like neutral entity to assess and get that data. I was going to get this until they hired Keith Costigan. That's a <laughs> that's, deal breaker. That's for it. Me. That's a deal breaker for yep. you. 
All right, my friend. Uh, should we light this candle? Let's do it. All right. We are coming to you, as we said, on Wednesday. The window has shut. There is all sorts of uh, incredible uh, movement and things that have happened. Where do you want to start? Because it's impossible for us to hit every single one. So we're just going to give you uh, just an oversight and the things that popped out, both the deals that happened and maybe some deals that didn't happen. Well, the biggest overarching theme is the continued financial largesse of the Premier League. Different numbers being floated around, but the one I saw, the Premier League spent more than 800 million euros in this window, while La Liga, Serie A, the Bundesliga, and Liga combined spent roughly 250 million euros. So it's no surprise that the Super League folks, their rhetoric now is very much that we need the Super League to combat the Premier League. That's what the Adnellis of the world are saying. And certain a part of me, I guess, understands that and, and feels their pain. But the other part of me is says, keep up, figure, figure it out. And I think their, their point would be, but this is outlandish spending and this is ridiculous spending. Now, keep in mind, you know, the financial fair play, <laughs> what it was on paper and what it was in theory, in practice has worked out very, very differently. And we've seen, and this happens in all industries, you try to find loopholes. It happens, you know, in taxes and, and, and business and all that kind of stuff. You try to find loopholes to your advantage. Not illegal, not against the laws, maybe at times against the spirit of the law, but you try to find ways to gain an advantage until those loopholes are closed. So for 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 example, amortizing things over year after year after year of the spend that you have as opposed to the money that you ultimately make, it can make it look a uh, make you look a whole lot better. But all of that doesn't mean anything uh, relative to what you are talking about, which ultimately is that when it comes to spending, it's not as if they're just a little bit ahead. They are light years ahead when it comes to what England spends. I, because it's not my money, it's somebody else's money, I like when people spend. I like to spend other people's money. We are incredibly good at spending other people's money, especially when it brings in talent and sexiness and appeal and all that kind of stuff, and it increases our chances of viewing what is already the most popular league in the world. So leading the way in this Premier League spending is Chelsea, who had an astonishing window. Uh, they signed eight players for more than 300 million euros, and they've already lined up Christopher and Kunku for next season, so you could add him to the mix. Todd Bowley figured out that the way to Chelsea fans' hearts is by spending crazy money. It's what Roman Abramovich did 20 years ago when he arrived, so Todd Bowley is borrowing from that playbook. Uh, the exclamation point yesterday on deadline day, they signed Argentinian midfielder Enzo Fernandez from Benfica for a Premier League record 121 million euros. And yeah, to your point, all the players they're acquiring are young. They're giving them lengthy contracts, and you're allowed to take the money you spend in a transfer and spread it out over the duration of the player's contract. So it doesn't seem like that much per year. Enzo Fernandez, for example, 121 million euros. They gave him an eight-year contract. So that comes out to about 15 million euros per year for the next eight years, which doesn't look that bad in an accounting book. Uh, but UEFA are apparently not happy with this. They're talking about implementing a rule that you can only spread a transfer out over the first five years of a player's contract, regardless of how long a contract you give them. So we'll see if that rule goes into effect. It would mitigate Why is that. This being fixed now, like there's, I mean, I, I say this, and I know people are laughing, but there are smart people behind the implementation. I would submit to you, probably they didn't want to fix it, and they wanted to have loopholes, and they wanted to make it gray as much as they as much as they possibly can. So I'll believe it when I see it when it comes to spending. Do you think that there is? I know in, in totality we've been talking about what EPL does, but let's just for, from a Chelsea perspective, with what Chelsea is right now, which is a mid-level type of team, is there a method to the madness or is this just a shock and awe type of thing that is being done? I do question it a little bit, whether there's an actual plan there. Um, I joked on our last podcast that Enzo Fernandez is the winner of the James Rodriguez Award for having a World Cup inflate your value. I will say, though, I think he's an excellent player. He's going to help Chelsea. You look at this list of signings, he's the closest thing to a sure thing, I would say. Then Mihailo Mudrik, very talented as well, showed some real flashes in his debut at Anfield. And then Cuckoo, who's arriving next season as a player I love. But Chelsea do have this horrible track record in recent years of getting the most out of attacking players. So we'll see with those two. And then there's a whole bunch of young guys that I think are very hit or miss. These Benoit Badiashil and Malu Gusto and Noni Madweki. Uh, they could work out, but 
they might not. I will say, if I can put my Brazilian hat on here for yes. one second. Well, can you can you ever take it off? Uh, amidst all this crazy spending, they did make one move that I think would end up being an incredible bargain, which is they signed this 18-year-old Brazilian midfielder, Andre Santos, for only 12.5 million euros. Uh, he's a terrific player. Right now, he's captaining Brazil in the South American Under-20 Championships. He's been the best player in that tournament, has four goals in four games. I'm a big fan of his. When you look at the crazy money that's thrown around on Brazilians, we talked about in our last pod how uh, Brazilians, their value tends to be overinflated. That's an example of you getting a Brazilian for a bargain because that kid has a potential to turn into a real star. And for them to get him for only 12 and a half million euros, I think is, is incredible bit of business. But yeah, overall, they spent crazy money. Now we've talked about this before, this concept of overspending. Um, if there is no salary cap and you're in compliance with financial fair play and you have limitless funds, so spending big on one player doesn't preclude you from spending big on another if you really want him. Does it matter if you see a player you like and he'll make you better? Does it matter if you spent 60, 80, 100? Is that something that fans love to talk about? But it, in the final analysis, what's the, what's the difference? I mean, does the, does the number that's attached to the player matter? Yeah, yeah. People get so hung up on, oh, he's good, but you overspent for him. And that really matters in American sports where there's a salary cap and you overspending on a player can hurt your ability to strengthen other positions. I wonder sometimes at high-level European football, we talk about this stuff overspending, but does it actually matter? Yeah, I mean... Because it doesn't have a direct hit or uh, it it doesn't put the, the spender in, in a problematic position, literally financially, yeah, there's you're 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 losing less. But I do think that there's a game within the game and that there is a competition with the in the competition and that, you know, I don't know how much, you know, a oligarch or, you know, a nation state or something like that cares about when somebody says, hey, that was really smart business, or hey, they, they really know what they're doing in terms of identifying, uh, identifying talent. But I do think that from, from the outside, you know, that number that is attached to a player, we, whether it's right or wrong, we, we, you know, we associate that with the quality that they have. So I, I, I do think that it Yeah, matters. I would say the one caveat is uh, a big fee can affect the player's performance. It can be an albatross around sure. his neck and, sure. and create unrealistic expectations on the part of the fans. So in that respect, uh, it does matter. Uh, Chelsea also in the news on deadline day for a couple of other transactions. They tried to send Hakim Ziyech on loan to PSG. The deal was agreed. Fabrizio Romano gave it the here we go treatment. Ziyech was already in Paris, excited about it. He, it was going to be him reuniting with Ashraf Hakimi. He to Paris, right? Yep. <laughs> and then we come to find out that Chelsea sent the paperwork wrong four different times and they ended up missing the deadline. PSG were unhappy. They appealed. The appeal was rejected. And so Ziyech is now going to have to go back to Chelsea. I'll say this. If Chelsea did this on purpose, it's really Bush League. And if they didn't do it on purpose, it's really embarrassing right. on their part. Either way, it's... It, it, I, Masi, I cannot understand. I think it's grounds for firing, immediate termination, all right? If, if you mess up the paperwork. By the way, who even deals with paper anymore? I mean, I know I have this for, for a note and something like that, but this should be like just hitting a button. It should just happen automatically. There should be some formula. And if you don't, go hire some kid who can write the code to have the formula so you don't have to mess around anymore. This should never, ever happen. It should, And it's not an excuse if and when uh, it does happen because you should know you should have everything buttoned down and you should literally be able to press a button and it just all does it for itself and there is no problem. So I, I don't know ultimately uh, what happened. And it sucks. It sucks for the player. And then ultimately it sucks for you because you are going to look like a moron. I will say on the topic of Moroccan players, Olympique Marseille signed that midfielder Unahi, who was a real revelation at the World Cup. They got him for 8 million euros. He scored on his debut today against Nantes. That might be the biggest deal of this whole window because he's an amazing talent. But back to Chelsea. One player that did successfully unload is Jorginho, who goes to Arsenal. I think this is a sneaky good move. Arsenal, they wanted to add a midfielder. They tried for Moises Caicedo from Brighton. Once they realized that wasn't going to happen, they pivoted to Jorginho. Jorginho is a guy who's gone from being preposterously overrated a couple of years ago when he was touted as a Ballon d'Or contender, but to now being slightly underrated. I think he's actually Ooh, a really? good player for Arsenal to add in the middle of this title race. But this isn't going to you know, seal their fate relative to winning the title, but this is a nice piece to have. It's a nice depth piece to have. And Arsenal now is in that position 
where they're no longer in the desperation mode that we have seen them in the past, where you do strange and stupid things oftentimes. And so they can afford to kind of pick and choose and just add some things that are going to help them get uh, get them where they want. Um, other other uh, deals out there. Well, more good news for Arsenal is that uh, the team that's chasing them in the Premier League, I think, got weaker on deadline day. Uh, Manchester City sent Jean Cancelo on loan to Bayern. Listen, I've, I've heard multiple podcasts on The Athletic explain to me why this had to happen. I guess his relationship with Pep had really deteriorated and he was acting up and training to the point where it was annoying the other players. Very Gio reina uh, um, um, And so Pep felt like we just have to get this guy out of here, okay? But the bottom line is, on paper, Manchester City's squad is weaker today than it was yesterday. And this is a potentially incredible move for Bayern if he can recapture his best form there. Because I do think João Cancelo, when he's playing well, is terrific. If he's happy. But, you know, again, Bayern will have looked at the situation, kicked the tires, and kind of looked and said, all right, this is an unhappy player. Doesn't mean he's not. I mean, well, he, is a, he is a great player. And we can use him. I, I agree with you. I think that this is... They... You know, while while Manchester City will look at it as addition by subtraction, I think Bayern Munich will say we will take your malcontent right now because we have an opportunity. Well, I don't know he's necessarily going to play and start every single game, but he is undoubtedly a good player that needs a change of uh, change of scenery. So that's the incoming from Bayern Munich. Sabitzer went out, and so I think Bayern Munich did a good job. This, yep. this window. Sabitzer goes to Manchester United. He's a replacement for Christian Eriksen, who's going to be out three months with an injury. And, you know, I saw Paul Merson crapping on this and saying, well, Sabitzer wasn't starting regularly for Bayern, so how good could he be? I just wish for once a Premier League pundit could admit that he doesn't follow other leagues, isn't that familiar with a player that a Premier League team is acquiring. They always have to come up with some take, and it's always some simplistic take they pulled out of their ass that just shows that they have no clue about it. And they can't say anything actually insightful about the player. So, it, you know what I mean? These Graham Sunnises and Paul Mersons. So that, that was... Uh, this Windows edition of an ignorant Premier League pundit's uh, take I, on it. A... I mean, I like Sabitzer. He would start at most places around the world. I mean, Absolutely. not starting at Bayern Munich, mm-hmm. okay, does not make you an average player or a mediocre player. And by the way, this isn't some obscure player coming from some obscure team, okay? I mean, I, I, I get it. We, it's impossible, unless you're a savant like yourself, to be able to follow every single team and know every single player out there. But this is, like I said, this is not just some... Just, just, just any player, and so it's a, you know, I think it's a good signing. And from a Manchester United perspective, again, it, it, it goes back to kind of they're not where that they're not where Arsenal is, okay. But this is a much more low key, almost strategic. Dare I say strategic when it comes to Manchester United uh, type of signing for them. Uh, we mentioned Manchester City sent João Cancelo on loan to Bayern. There were reports on Monday that. They were going to go after Anthony Robinson as his replacement. Nothing came of it. Some people think maybe in the summer they will. But that was an interesting 24 hours there where U.S. fans thought that was an actual possibility that Anthony Robinson was going to go to Manchester City. You know what? Uh, So I like the, um, you know, I I love all the rumors and I love all the speculation, whether it happens or not. I mean, sometimes the deals that don't happen are are even more interesting than the ones that do. You mentioned uh, Hakim Siak, uh, then that one that fell through. Julian Araujo from the LA Galaxy. I know you're going to get to that because oh, that's uh, you know that's that's craziness. But this is this is kind of uh, this is kind of what we want. I mean, strange ones like the Matt Doherty situation going from Spurs to Atletico Madrid. Uh, so it hit on, hit on a couple of those. But I, I I love all this weird stuff that's going on in the weeds. And again, a lot of it comes down to desperation, and we got to make a move, and we we either literally need something in order to to do well, or we need to put that message out that we are spending and we are doing something to make us better. Yeah, the Araujo one is incredible. So Barcelona attempted to acquire him from the Galaxy. and the, pa- the Los Angeles Galaxy of Major League Soccer, right? Correct. Okay. Araujo, who's played for the U.S., but ultimately chose to represent Mexico internationally. Um, and from what you read, the paperwork was 18 seconds late. <laughs> so uh, Barcelona are appealing to FIFA. As of this taping, a Wednesday afternoon, I have not heard one way or the other whether they're going to get him. Well, I've already told you w- what should happen if you mess up the paperwork. Grounds for termination immediately. I feel sorry for guys like Araujo and Ziyech, but again, you wonder with these clubs, why do you wait until the very last minute? You had 30 days to figure out your 
transfer business. There's got to be something else going on, okay? <laughs> and, you know, there was all sorts of talk about, did they even know that this transfer was happening? And was Barcelona really into it? And Oh, my goodness. Uh, one last, last move I want to talk about uh, that happened within CONCACAF. Uh, Christian Arango leaves LAFC. He's off to reigning Mexican champions Pachuca. Yep. And let me say this. Maybe when you get into the ins and outs of it, Arango was asking for a new contract. He might have been asking for too much money. And it might be a justifiable decision on LAFC's part. But I still come away with this inescapable feeling that Christian Arango was never fully appreciated in MLS. You're talking about a, a South American striker in his mid-20s who showed up and from day one performed. He scored the second most goals in the league during his time in MLS, second only to Hani Mukhtar. He helped LAFC last season win a supporter shield in MLS Cup. And there was always a sense that they were quite willing to unload him if the right offer came along. It was very strange. It was yeah. very strange. Absolutely the Rodney Dangerfield of you know recent years of MLS. And so I, I wish him well. And LAFC loses, like, like you said, a consistent goal score. Uh, I will finish up uh, uh, on this one because I just wanted to mention it. It has to do with CONCACAF. Kaylor Navas, the great Kaylor Navas, arguably the best CONCACAF player in history, finds uh, his way to, uh, uh, to, England, uh, to England from PSG to Nottingham Forest. I think that's a sneaky good pickup. He's still uh, in, his, in his 30s and still a wonderful goalkeeper. Uh, they have some injury problems when it comes to the goalkeeping at uh, Forest. They give up a lot of goals over there at Forest, so he might immediately be tested, and this might be an interesting move for him. I totally agree. I think you talk about Rodney Dangerfield for Arango. Kaylor Navas is the ultimate Rodney, the most underrated player in world football in the last 10 years, the way he was treated at both Real Madrid and PSG. Um, but, uh, yeah, so Forrest, who have made a zillion moves here, did not get Brenner, by the way. We, we teased that on our last pod. Didn't that didn't materialize. So Brenner's still in MLS. But Congratulations, they, by the way, to the great Matt Doherty for moving from uh, Spurs to Atletico <laughs> Madrid. Yeah, you mentioned that. Uh, Tottenham wanted to loan him, and then they came to realize that they had exceeded the loan limit, so it couldn't be a loan, so they just rescinded his contract, and he goes to... This, this should not be a... Again... Uh, see, I remember I told that story about it. I went out to the national team, the U.S. men's national team, and there were like 40 people in red sweatshirts. Like the staff completely outnumbered the actual amount of players. In the modern day game, the amount of people that you have focused, whose only job is to focus on what is going on in terms of the product on the field and obviously how to get that product on the field. This should never happen. These types of things should never, ever happen. These, these clubs have enough people. They have enough technology. They have enough wherewithal. I guess they have enough smarts where somebody should be there manning the station. It should never, it, it should never happen the way that it, unfortunately, consistently happens window after window after window. Uh, so that's it for the January transfer window in Europe. Uh, lots of U.S. women's national team news that I know you wanted to talk about. Uh, let's see here. So uh, just a couple of things here. Uh, I want to make sure that I, that I get to this. U.S. women's national team uh, news. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, number one, and this is more off the field, and this is actually much more about big, big picture soccer, what's going on in U.S. soccer. You remember the Yates report that came out. And, you know, it was a year-long type of deep dive into what was going on and some of the real problems, uh, structural problems, and systemic problems that the game has. Uh, they released a uh, report, and the follow-up, uh, which was actually led by our friend Daniel Slayton, uh, has come back with recommendations as to what should happen uh, going forward. And I just want to make sure that I uh, that I have this right. Okay, here we go. So a couple of the different things. Now, these are recommendations. It still has to go to a vote. But I, look, I think that this made enough waves and is important enough where these types of things, although they're recommendations, I think they're going to be implemented. Now, the how they are implemented is important. But ultimately, at the core and at the root of all of this is about making sure that players are safer, making sure that players are in a better position and a safer position than they have been in the past and rectifying some of those things. So uh, different stuff like uh, changes to the professional league standards, which is 
in the United States Soccer Federation, these are standards that every league has to adhere to relative to how they are uh, sanctioned, and including uh, each league ha- and each of its members, clubs appointing a player safety officer, prohibition on the, uh, the use of non-disclosure and non-disparagement agreements, requirement all leagues report all allegations. Some of this seems like just, uh, you know, very simple and no-brainer type of stuff, but unfortunately, it has to be put down, and more importantly, it has to be accepted and implemented going forward. And a provision that U.S. Soccer would uh, to place leagues and teams on probation and levy fines coming from U.S. Soccer. So I think that all of this will be uh, adopted and approved, but then in the actual day-to-day implementation of this program, that's where it really has to count, and that's where that protection has to come. Otherwise, a year from now, two years from now, we'll be right back and we'll have another report. It'll have a different name in front of it that will say, hey, these are the problems that need to be fixed. And if we have these types of uh, problems and we recognize them and we don't fix them, then that's on us. So, uh, you know, hopefully that uh, that gets done. So I wanted to mention that. Uh, the great Sam Mewis, uh, not good news when it comes to her. She is out with a long-term injury when it comes to the knee. We don't know when we are going to see her. Certainly, she's going to be gone for this year. And obviously, the uh, uh, the women's national team when it comes to uh, the World Cup coming up this summer. Speaking of the World Cup co- coming up this summer, uh, the She Believes Cup is coming up. That's another preparation. We mentioned that um, and the importance of... Uh, the uh, the roster. I want to make sure that I got this roster right, Mossy. Uh, okay, so a lot of the usual uh, suspects out there. And again, why is this important? Uh, Megan Rapino back in the fold. So that's a uh, you know that's a a return. Rose Lavelle continues on uh, these types of players. Trinity Rodman, uh, Mitch Purse, those types of uh, players. So the the young. And up-and-coming players are now being involved with the older players. Crystal Dunn's there, Becky Saubrin, so uh, the usual suspects. And again, it gets closer and closer to the World Cup. So these roster drops are important because Lobotko Andonovsky has to decide and figure out what that 23 players are going to look like come that uh, World, Cup, uh, World Cup this summer. I did see that uh, Sophia Smith, they said, was recovered from her injury, but her fitness isn't quite up to snuff yet, so he left her out for this tournament, but hopefully she'll but get back soon. But she's definitely part of the plans, Correct. Uh, given how good she is. She just, from a physical perspective, isn't there yet. And and I think she will get there, so she's absolutely going to be obviously surprised, as long as it continues to go as planned from her uh, recovery, if she's not there. And uh, to a to a certain extent, uh, is absolutely in the uh, in the running when it comes to starting for this team. Uh, Brazil uh, named their, she believes, Cup squad yesterday, and it includes Marta, which was somewhat surprising because she's rehabbing from a long-term knee injury. I didn't think she was healthy enough to be part of this roster, but apparently she is, so she'll be there as well. Hey, look, if, if Marta can walk, you call her in, okay? Well, uh, that's how great she is. And uh, All right, well, so we look forward to that. Um, MLS news, you want to uh, go over a little bit of that? Uh, well... This is sort of MLS news since an MLS club is taking part in this tournament. Uh, the Club World Cup got underway today. Uh, the first match, Al Ali of Egypt disposed of New Zealand's Auckland City with 3 ease, 0. With ease. And that sets up on Saturday, quarterfinal Al Ali against the Seattle Sounders of MLS. The winner of that faces Real Madrid in the semis the following week. Al Ali. Solid team. They have pedigree in this competition. They've been in it a few times. A lot of MLS fans were watching this game today. Had that look that Mickey had watching those Clubber Lang fights in the opening montage of Rocky Three. So they're already anticipating a tough game on Saturday. Well, it should be a tough game. It's the Club World Cup. And uh, this is, you know, the culmination of what has happened over the last year with Seattle and how excited I know a lot of us, including myself, were that an MLS team was going to represent CONCACAF, and now they're going to come up against the best in the world. And this is what this is what you want, because this generates not just interest and excitement, but if it goes well, it generates credibility around the world and back home. So good luck to uh, Brian Schmetzer and company as they face, as they faced, uh, they face Al Ali again on FS2 uh, this uh, this Saturday morning. So tune into uh, into that and we'll. You know, obviously, I'll be pulling for Seattle. I would love nothing more than to see them get a chance to take a uh, take a swing at uh, the Great Real Madrid. That is it. All right, let's take a break, and when we come back, uh, we'll have a weekend preview. Don't go anywhere. All right, welcome back. All right, let's take a little uh, look around uh, Europe in terms of a preview this weekend. Mossy, lots of stuff happening. Where do you want to start? Over there in the uh, that EPL thing. Let's start in England. The League Cup final is set. 
yesterday, Newcastle 2-1 winners over Southampton to uh, complete a 3-1 aggregate triumph. And then today, Manchester United 2-0 winners over Nottingham Forest to complete a 5-0 aggregate triumph. So that sets up Newcastle, Manchester United, February 26 at Wembley. Um, Bruno Guimarães sent off yesterday late in the match. He got a straight red card. That means a three-game suspension, but that carries over to the Premier League. So he'll serve that in Newcastle's next three league games. That hurts their top four ambitions, but he will be back. How is that fair? What do you mean? It's like it carries over. It Any domestic competition you play, uh, red cards carry over in England. So right. he'll be eligible for the League Cup final February 26, which is a tasty game on Newcastle against yeah. Manchester United. I love it. I love it. Uh, any games you're looking forward to this weekend? Yes. In the Premier League... Um, Arsenal away to Everton. That'll be Sean Dyche's debut on the Everton bench. Keith Costigan, very critical of this appointment. I saw a clip of him on the radio talking well, about... It's, it's well known that he hates Sean Dyche. I mean, we, well, we all know that. Well, Keith's point was that, you know, everybody talks about how if you're in a relegation race, you should get a manager that's accustomed to being in relegation battles. But the point Keith raised was, if you're a manager who's accustomed to being in relegation battles, maybe it doesn't speak well of you in general. <laughs> what, what does that mean, that, uh, that that someone is accustomed, well, I mean, if they've had their experience, but what are they doing differently? they just obviously not being as romantic and risky and, and as expansive as one might be if they were not worried about a, a relegation battle? I mean, what is it? Yeah, there, there's, it this, there's this thought process that uh, when you're down there at the bottom, you just need a manager that's adept at grinding out results. You don't need to bring in a Bielsa, well, somebody how, that's going to try to do anything too extravagant. Well, how does that manifest, do you think, when this when this person comes in and speaks to the, to the team for the first time and says, hey, you know, we're in the shit here. we got to figure this out. What is this person actually saying? I don't want you to attempt to dribble or to pass or to do anything other than defend and make sure we don't let in goals and then on the off chance that we do get the ball hopefully you get taken down for a foul and then we bring it up for set piece i think that's it that's sean Deitch football in a nutshell right there you just summed it up <laughs> all right okay well we'll look i'm looking forward to seeing it I, my uh you know i i uh i have plenty of friends that are everton fans and you know the the level of fear and misery right now i i, I i've never seen it this bad so he's got his hands full uh, Wesson McKinney could make his debut for Leeds uh, away to Nottingham Forest, which is kind of interesting because Forest was a team that also tried yeah. to get him. They tried to hijack that deal late, but he ended up at Leeds. Um, you are going to be interested in this game, but you've made abundantly clear on Twitter the only reason you care about this game is because there are Americans involved. Yeah, I mean, so look, I ultimately I am... I am excited and happy uh, for Weston that he has found a place, and I will be watching. Um, you know, I, I said this the other day on Twitter, and I, and I think I've talked about this before, but, you know, the, for many American fans, including myself, all right, not everybody, but for many, Leeds is our weekly must-watch EPL team. You know, when I roll over early on a Saturday, Sunday, you know, I make sure that of all the different games that I can watch, if Leeds is involved, that's the one I'm watching. And it's not because of their history. It's not because of their passion. It's not because of their culture. But it's simply because of the pride in that obvious American connection with Jesse Marsh's coach and with now all of these uh, different players, whether it's actual U.S. men's national team players or even Jack Harrison, who played in MLS and, uh, and comes from American University. That is the attraction. And let's be honest, Mossy. That is what is being sold when it comes to the Leeds brand. And if and when that changes, Jesse's gone, the players are gone, that American connection is gone, there will be those that stay. You need only look at the Fulham fans that were created during Clint Dempsey or Brian McBride's time. But many of us will look elsewhere. Now, does that mean that... I don't recognize that long history. I talked a little bit about it on the previous pod, or I don't recognize that there that there is that there is incredible um, support for this team. No, but what it did bring up was this this discussion. It's kind of an evergreen evergreen discussion about what is fandom and this, you know, the purity test for fandom out there, especially when it comes to American soccer versus, you know. English soccer and, and or international soccer for that matter. But the reality is that, that you don't get to tell me 
what fandom is or what true fandom is. Or actually, you don't get to define it for me. And I don't get to define it for you. And, you know, so the point that I was trying to make going back and forth with all of these Leeds fans was to illustrate how in, you know, the modern business of marketing your brand, which is what these clubs are, marketing them globally, which is what they all want to do, it can be very different than the traditional marketing marketing of your team locally. And so that traditional customer experience that we associate with teams, you know, and the attraction and the connection to that product, it it can be redefined. And oftentimes it's being redefined from a thousand miles away. And look, I hope that if and when this ends, this Americanism of Leeds, that there are plenty of Leeds fans that say, you know, that's that's my team. But I'm just pointing out the fact that this is this is why Amer- Americans, a lot of Americans are watching. And I know I'm not alone. And it's different. If you're already a Leeds fan, that's that's different. But you can imagine the reaction from Leeds fans over there. Some of them even used actual full sentences. So I was impressed with that. Uh, the big one <laughs> in England this weekend, uh, Tottenham will host Manchester City. These two teams just played, mind you. You might recall yep. Spurs had a 2-0 halftime lead, and then City scored four on answer. They won 4-2. So now they meet again. Uh, City five points back of Arsenal in Gotta the win. Premier League race. Yep. Got to win. Uh, in the Bundesliga, the big game this weekend, Wolfsburg hosting Bayern Munich. Uh, Bayern uh, still seeking their first league win since the returning from the winter break. They won in the German Cup today. Uh, Wolfsburg, they had been on a great run of form. Their first two games after coming back from the winter break, 6-0 win over Freiburg, 5-0 win over Hertha Berlin. But then they lost to Werder Bremen last weekend and lost to Union Berlin in the German Cup. So that momentum halted. We'll see what they can do here. Nico Kovac, by the way, is the Wolfsburg coach, former Bayern player and manager. So that adds some spice to this fixture. Yeah, but they, you know they have bolstered their ranks when it comes to Bayern Munich for this 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 run in. So I mean, if there ever was a time for them to go on a run, and we've seen them go on a run, this is it. Uh, Union Berlin hosts Mainz, Leipzig away to Cologne, Dortmund hosts Freiburg. We'll see if Gio Reyna plays. He's not a hundred percent, you know. I I heard that he's not a hundred percent. So at some point he will be. Uh, at which point he will, you know, figure in as a starter. Uh, in France, we had a midweek round. Uh, PSG victorious today, th- today 3-1 away to Montpellier. Uh, Neymar did not play due to muscle fatigue. Mbappe started, missed a penalty twice. Did you see this? He missed a penalty, got to retake it, missed it again, and then shortly thereafter came off injured. But PSG still got the win 3-1. Messi among the scorers. So uh, they pick up three He's points. Human. He's human. You know, nope. It happens. Uh, so muscle fatigue, is that what it is? Did you see in the uh, in the basketball where people were uh, holding up signs and angry about the uh, the rotation? I don't know what they call it in in, uh, in basketball, but this is it's a big topic in in the NBA. The schedule is so congested, and teams don't want to wear out their players, so they're picking games and just sitting out all their starters. But then the fans that paid good money to go to those games are unhappy. So there's a lot of conversation about what can the NBA do to and then I address saw, that. Uh, the St- Steve Kerr is that his name? Uh, they, or whatever. Sure, yeah. So we should play less games or whatever. They so fine. You take less money, you'll play less games. There you go. Ah, look at you yeah. going after Steve Kerr. Um, a- another league on game I want to highlight today. Hans, 4-2 winners over Lorient. Uh, Folarin Balogun with a hat trick. We talked about him on the last pod after he scored a late equalizer against PSG. He is the young man who could play for the U.S., Nigeria, or England. It's probably going to be the U.S. or England. And a lot of U.S. fans on pins and needles because he could be an incredible addition to the ranks this cycle. And look, you know, we, we come from a culture that does understand recruitment, right? While, while soccer isn't king, everybody can understand the importance of recruitment. You, you talk about your Harbos, Harbaugh's and all these you know, different types of coaches and the importance of being consistent, making sure that you are in, in contact within the law and, and the rules out there. But this goes back again to, you know, who's minding the shop right now? Who's, who's reaching out? Who is making this call? Who is saying, hey, uh, we, we, we saw this incredible performance. Just wanted to check in and say that was awesome. We're so happy for you and so proud of you. But, I mean, sometimes it's literally that. It's like show them that you care. So, all right. Well, I mean, he's, he's a goal scorer. He has a position of need, and he can play for the U.S. 
Uh, today was actually signing day in college football. Michigan lost out on a five-star recruit to South Carolina, Nicholas Harbor. Wow. You think that guy really wanted to go there? He was just worried that Harbaugh isn't going to be there when he gets there. NIL, baby. It's changed the game. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. They, yeah. Bags of cash, and off he goes to South Speaking Carolina. Speaking of uh, bags of cash, anything uh, going over there in uh, in Spain? Yes. Uh, Barcelona, 2-1 winners over Real Betis today. Rafinha and Lewandowski with their goals. Uh, tomorrow, Real Madrid host Valencia, who just fired Gennaro, got two. So remember, these were the four teams that played in the Spanish Super Cup in Saudi Arabia, so they missed a La Liga round for that, so this is making up those games. Real Madrid will take the field tomorrow. Eight points back of Barcelona live standings. They should beat Valencia, but it's a little bit of pressure to do yeah. so. They can't gotta keep slip it. up. You got to keep it close. And, and then at the week- then it might not work. All right. And then at the weekend, Barcelona home to Sevilla. Real Madrid away to Stu Holden's Mallorca. Oh, good luck, Stu. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at, by the end of this week, Real Madrid should definitely have six points, but the problem is they need Barcelona to slip up. Yep. And finally, in Italy, the big one is the Milan Derby, Inter against AC Milan. Now, mind you, with Napoli running away with the title, the intrigue in Serie A now is top four. Uh, Inter currently in second. AC Milan have slipped to fifth. Uh, the last two league games, they lost 4-0 to Lazio and 5-2 to Sassuolo. And then the game before that, they lost 3-0 to Inter in the Super Cup. So they're really struggling. But it's all bunched together. Second through six are separated by three points. So if Milan win this game, they shoot right back up there. You know what Milan should do? All right, notwithstanding Serginio Dest, they should hire Tony Miola to coach Milan. Then, then I'll be watching every single week. My goodness. I know he loves his, uh, his Milan team. So, all right. Anything else? It's This is, again, from a Scudetto pr perspective, it's done and dusted. Yeah, Napoli away to Spezia, which uh, should be another three points for them as they continue to roll towards the Scudetto. All right, but all sorts of soccer to watch a feast of uh, wonderful games and wonderful players. And now that the window is closed, we get to start to assess as to how the transfer window was, whether it's immediate, and we'll look forward to seeing, hopefully, uh, Weston McKinney on for uh, Leeds and all of these other players with their uh, their new outfits. All right, let's take another quick break. When we come back, it's time for Ask Alexi. All right, welcome back, and it's time for Ask Alexi, uh, that point in the show where you send in some questions. You can do it online and use that hashtag, Ask Alexi, on all the different social media platforms. And keep in mind, our handle is SOTU with Alexi. Or you can call in to our Studio of the Union podcast hotline, which is 657-549-2297, 657-549-2297. Uh, what do we have this week, Masi? Uh, we have a couple of voicemails. Let's hear the first one right now. This is Alex Goldstein out of Austin, Texas. And my question is for uh, my fellow Brazilian, David Mossi. Hashtag Pergunta Mossi. Uh, my question for you, Mossi, is who are you expecting to be the next coach for the Brazilian national team? And uh, what are your expectations for this new coach, if we if Brazil does happen to perhaps maybe get a European uh, coach, thanks a lot. You guys are the best. Obrigado, Mossi. Abraço. All right. Obrigado. What did he hashtag? What was he? Uh, what was he saying? Yeah, Gunta Mossi. That means. Oh, uh, okay. Got ask it. Mossi. Perfect. Oh, that's oh, that's wonderful. All right. Cool. Um, all right. So listen, take it, my friend. What uh, What do you have? What are your thoughts? Yeah, you know, somebody tweeted at us this week um, about the fact that no foreign manager has ever won a Men's World Cup. And I said, to be fair, the elite uh, nations that realistically have the players to win a World Cup have rarely, if ever, gone the foreign manager route. But we could have an interesting ca test case because Brazil, there's a decent chance, is going to hire a foreign manager. Yeah, this is an interesting development. In the past, national sensibilities were such that Brazil would never consider hiring a foreign manager. We're Brazil. We don't have to go that route. But it's now been 20 years without a World Cup. There's a sense that uh, Brazilian managers have fallen behind um, the top managers of the rest of the world. And there's been more and more foreign managers in the Brazilian league in recent years, which have kind of laid the groundwork for a greater acceptance of the idea of foreign managers in general. And so the climate feels right now where there's a growing sentiment that Brazil needs to hire a foreign manager. Now, they're aiming high. You're hearing names like Zidane and Pep and Ancelotti, and I find all those to be highly unrealistic. Uh, the one guy I've heard that actually seems to be interested is Luis Enrique, who just uh, left Spain. 
Uh, I don't know if that would be a great fit, but nevertheless, that seems like a guy that uh, they might go after. Ronaldo is serving as an intermediary, played with Luis Enrique at Barcelona, knows him. Um, what's probably going to end up happening is they're going to strike out with all these big name foreign guys and then have to circle back to a Brazilian guy. Um, the, the one name which is interesting is Palmeiras have a foreign coach, a Portuguese guy named Abel Fajeda. And so he represents kind of a middle ground because, yes, he's foreign, but he's been coaching in the Brazilian league to great success, very familiar with Brazilian domestic football. He seems more palatable even to the more nationalistic pundits in Brazil. Uh, so they could go for like him. Jurgen Klinsmann. <laughs> um, and, you know, por- he's Portuguese. He speaks the language. It seems It's less sort of dramatic than hiring some guy who doesn't speak a word of Portuguese. So why do you think the sentiment has changed in that people and maybe maybe they haven't, but the way I'm getting it from you is that the Brazilians are more open to this absolutely as opposed to in the past. Yeah, there's a there's a growing sense that the Brazilian pool of candidates is is especially weak right now, that Brazilian coaches in general have are just sort of behind in the times in terms of their ideas of style of play. And so if Brazil insists on Brazilian managers, it's going to actually cause them to really fall behind. And so desperate times call for desperate measures. 20 years without a World Cup, which for us is a sure. major drought. And so, yeah, I think the groundwork is there. Let me just say this. If Brazil, if they were to hire a Brazilian manager still, uh, there's a guy at Fluminense, which is my favorite club, Fernando Geniz, who would be a very controversial selection because he's never won anything, but he is a romantic his teams play a very attractive style. And I'd be curious to pair his ideas with the quality of player you have in the national team, which is much higher than what you have on any Brazilian club. So it, that could be an interesting marriage to see what that guy could do if you gave him players the caliber that Brazil has. Scaloni never won anything. Yeah, you know, Br- Brazil... Southgate never won anything. No, that's a great point. Brazilian pundits are very hung up on this thing of, oh, what has he won? And other countries, you see, if, if if they like a guy, if he seems like he has interesting ideas and seems like he has the personality for the job, they're willing to take that chance. Brazil, not so much. So we'll see. You know, you mentioned Luis Enrique. And, and when people ask me, who would you be OK with? Who would you like to see? I, I got a lot of time for Luis Enrique. I, I think especially of, you know, because there is language does matter. OK. And the ability to speak the language is important. But. If you took that out of the equation, you know, and I don't know how well or or if at all he speaks English, but let's just say it's it's not great. I I just I like his I like his character, uh, I like his personality, I like his passion, and I think that that would be something that would be really interesting uh, going forward. So I just, I want to put him out. So you've evolved a bit on the language thing because in the last cycle when U.S. soccer didn't pursue yeah. Tata Martino and they, the stated reason was he didn't speak the language, you were kind of okay with that, but... Oh, no, I think you should speak the language. I think ideally. Yes, ideally. But if you're, if you're not and, and it, it's opened up to, to others, I mean, look, I got coached by Bora Milutinovic. I mean, he spoke five languages and he didn't speak any of them well. <laughs> so <laughs> it can certainly happen. It can certainly be. Uh, and 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 keep in mind too that there's one, you know, coaches that speak perfect English that suck. So it, it can it can work uh, work uh, work both ways. But uh, when do you think this is ultimately going to happen? Because we talk a lot about you know the uh, open vacancy right now from a U.S. men's perspective. How, how long do you think they're going to wait? Doesn't seem to be a big rush. Um, there's no major tournament this year for Brazil, uh, qualifying starts, but I've even heard that they'd be fine beginning qualifying with an interim guy. And if, if, if taking their time would lead to getting a better coach, then they're fine with that. All right. What else do we got? Uh, another voicemail. Hey, Alexi and Mossy. This is John from Richmond. I'm calling in in response to the other week when you were talking about a lot of the criticism you receive on a regular basis because of your personality and such. Um, I wanted to follow up because eight years ago, you are a guest on my friend's podcast, The Total Soccer Show, and my son Eli, who referred to you as Wexy at that time, asked you a question during the World Cup in Brazil about um, who your favorite Star Wars character was, and you found your answer pretty interesting in that you responded with Han Solo. So um, I'm an English teacher, and a couple of months ago, he asked me a question about literature, and since I know that you are also a English major, I figured I'd let he pose the question to you 
And Mossy, feel free to chime in as well. So this is my son, Eli, who is now 12, going on 13. Uh, hi, I'm Eli, and I was wondering what you would consider the quote-unquote great American novel. I'm currently reading Grapes of Wrath, but I'm looking for a new book. So if you could give me any suggestions, that would be appreciated. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys. We look forward to the answer to that question. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for calling in. And hello, Eli. Again, you're probably a much bigger version of yourself. But it's great to talk to you again, and thank you so much for uh, for that question. And, uh, you know, to you and your dad for uh, for calling in and saying those, uh, those ni- nice things. It's amazing how it seems like yesterday, but it was a long time ago, the... Uh, uh, the Brazil World Cup. Okay, so uh, you're reading Grapes of Wrath, so you're already off to a good start. And look, uh, no matter what I say here, people are going to say, yes, but this, yes, but this, yes, but this. There are so many wonderful books out there that can touch you, that can change your life. Uh, you're already off, like I said, to a good start there. I think a lot of people would put uh, you know, things like uh, The Great Gatsby, from F. Scott Fitzgerald. Uh, I think that's probably at the t- top of a lot of lists out there in terms of the great American novel, Moby Dick, The Sun Also Rises, um, maybe some more contemporary ones, uh, Bright Light, Big City, um, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, uh, Hunter Thompson, if you're into that. Um, on the Road, Jack Kerouac, a little more beat, uh, hippie type of thing there. Um, classics, Ventures of Tom Sawyer, Mark Twain, you cannot go wrong there. To Kill a Mockingbird, one, one of my favorites. Um, but I also I, I I think it's you know it's 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 kind of a uh, a natural type of answer to this question, but you know, JD Salinger's Catcher in the Rye, uh, I I think especially for where you are, you said you're you know 13, 14 years old, and certainly older, and certainly into into being an adult for a for a young boy, that might be really really interesting for you um, as in terms of where you are, what you're going through. I do think that even though it's many many decades old, there is a timelessness to it in terms of not just the human experience, but the teenage experience. And some of the disillusionment that you can have and some of the difficulties and challenges that I think is why it speaks to multiple generations and especially, you know, young people in that uh, in that moment. What do you got, Mossy? Uh, Great Gatsby would be my choice out of all the ones you said. I'm actually reading a great book right now. This is not a recommendation for the young man, but just (laughs) (laughs) uh, it's called The Good Spy. It's about uh, Robert Ames, this former CIA spy who specialized in the Middle East and died tragically in the Beirut embassy bombing in 1983. Mm-hmm. But it tells the story of his life. Fascinating. He played college basketball at LaSalle and, and he was six foot three and then went into service shortly thereafter. And just the, the life for a family like that to constantly be on the move, different Middle Eastern countries. They had kids and, you know, just it was fascinating to See what that life is of being a CIA spy in various different Middle Eastern countries. So um, about halfway through, I'm actually quite enjoying it. Uh, you know, uh, speaking of uh, you know history, Oppenheimer's coming out. Have you seen the uh, the previews for that? I'm excited about that. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I'm old enough to remember watching Paul Newman in uh, what is it, uh, Fat Man and Little Jake or whatever the, whatever it was back then, where they tried to tell the Oppenheimer story. I actually liked it. Uh, John Cusack was in it and and that kind of stuff. But this is, I think, going to be a whole other level. Very excited. Cannot wait. Okay. Can't wait for, uh, for that. Hey, listen, Eli, um, that you're reading in and of itself is wonderful. And I know you kind of have to do it for, for school, but that you are interested in reading further, that's wonderful. It's going to serve you well, not just in terms of the information that you take, but literally the actual act of reading is going to help you going, uh, going forward. And um, people find it attractive, so that can help you going forward too. Uh, anything else here, uh, Mossy, when it comes to uh, Ask Alexi? Uh, one quick note. Uh, a colleague of ours, Roman Portnoy, just walked by the studio and made eye contact with me. He is a big Chelsea fan. He had this huge smile on his face, and he gave me this look of like, yeah, you like it, right? And I know it's referring to Chelsea's transfer spending and activity. All so right, all che- right. Chelsea fans feeling pretty good about themselves. They're feeling pretty, pretty good right now. They spent a lot of money. All right, we'll take another quick break. When we come back, it's time for my uh, One for the Road. All right, welcome back. It's the end of our show, and at the end of each and every show, I give you my uh, one for the road. Mossy, um, this Friday I'm getting on a plane, 
and I'm heading to the great state of U Utah and the great city of Salt Lake City. You might be saying to yourself, why, Mossy? Are you saying to yourself, why? I am. I will tell you right now. About a, yeah, not a little less than a year ago, last summer, um, I was doing my usual Twitter back and forth, and you know, people interact with me. And look, I know that Twitter can be a toxic cesspool of negativity and pessimism, and very little light and kindness and romance, let alone love. But um, somebody uh, texted me and said, hey, I have a, a strange request. Would you ever think about officiating a wedding? And, you know, I get a lot of, you know, interesting interactions here. And But, you know, I said, you know what, I'll, I'll click on this. And uh, I ended up getting in touch with a young lady by the name of uh, Kristen. And come to find out after, uh, you know, uh, talking to her that she and her her um well soon to be husband ryan were looking to get married in uh the beginning of february 2023 and as is the case in a lot of weddings they you know you can have pretty much anybody that you want provided they are uh licensed wed you and i thought about it, i said hey you know that that sounds cool and it's an incredible honor and a, a privilege to be asked by somebody. And Kristen explained that, uh, you know, she, and in particular, uh, her fiance, Ryan, are huge soccer fans, uh, Real Salt Lake and soccer in general. She even, you know, had some pictures of me over the years with, uh, with Ryan. And, you know, she's setting up her wedding. And I said, yeah, no problem. So uh, on Friday, I'll get on the plane, I'll head over to, to, uh, to Salt Lake, I am, uh, as we said, I'm ordained. I am legal. I am legally able to uh, officiate this wedding and wed them. Uh, so, so says the American Marriage Ministries, the AMM, for those that uh, for those that know, which make me, as I said, a licensed and ordained minister. Now, this comes with incredible responsibility. And so I've been going back and forth with Kristen. And look, this is a bride-to-be on a very special moment. And she's got a million different things to do. And, you know, that that they want me to be involved in this very, very small way, I, I am incredibly uh, honored to be able to do that. And so it's going to be fun. We're going to have a Friday evening wedi wedding in uh, Salt Lake City with uh, Kristen and Ryan. And uh, I have practiced what I am going to say. Obviously, it's their wedding. And so, you know, they've given me what, uh, you know, what they want me to say. And I will hopefully pull off the performance to their liking. But by the time people hear this, at some point in the, here in the next couple of days, the wedding might be over. And so um, congratulations and best wishes to the happy couple, to Kristen and uh, Ryan. I hope you have a long uh and healthy and productive and successful and loving marriage and lifetime and i couldn't be happier to uh, be playing a very very small part so that's what i'm doing uh on friday Mossy. keep it pithy you can drone on sometimes so. listen it's it's very very clear i'm not going to be droning on it's going to, it's it's very short and sweet actually in a beautiful uh, way for the people that uh, that are there, and then we're going to have a big old party, and hopefully they'll let me stick around. Is this essentially a trial for Cat Donnelly's wedding? Because if you do well here, that's a real possibility. That wedding is like the social event of Listen, the year. I understand that, and I would never be so bold. Okay, I'm and and again, I have been around brides and grooms, and it, it, there's a lot of stress, uh, and there's a lot of planning, and I want to make sure that my little part is not any of those things, that my little part is taken care of. They know exactly what they're going to get. It's going to be something that they, that they have, in this case, written, and it is what they want. And I am just here to give them exactly what they need. But if there's others out there, I'm available. Sounds good. All right, my friend. Well, uh, listen, uh, this is the first of two parts here. So next week, I will have the pictures. I will have the stories of this uh, of this trip over to uh, to Salt Lake. So it sh I will make sure that we, we bring those and kind of 
pay off this ultimately story. So that is, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's my uh, end of the uh, podcast uh, story there. And I'll let you know how it goes. Anything before we go, Mossy? That's it. All right. Thank you so much to everybody for, you know, your continued reviewing and downloading and subscribing and all the different things that you uh, that you do as we crank out the State of the Union podcast. Uh, we We love doing it, but it only works with all of you out there. We will talk again next week where there will be all sorts of stuff. Enjoy the weekend, all the different games that we had. There's plenty of soccer going on out there. Like I said, weddings, soccer games, all sorts of stuff going on. I hope everybody is having a wonderful and, uh, and, a, uh, and, a, and a safe February of 2023. We'll talk again next week. And until then, and as always, my friends, size the day.